This is in your book, but I want to, you probably can't even read it from where you are because it's really late. Um, but this chart comes just before Inferno. And I just wanted to put it up as a visual reminder as we progress. Okay, Dante's doing a couple of things with this imagery. Because bear in mind, you know, we start here, and if we're, this were to be drawn more accurately, it would look like this. And you've got purgatory, you know, here, Jerusalem here, hell kind of here, you know, waters in between, and such. And, and the chart tries to portray this, but it's, it's really, you know, and this is why I've done God like that. Because it's really one way of looking at it is like this, where God is at the center. Okay. Dante's going to use a phrase, I don't remember which, Canto 15, 15 through 18 somewhere, where he's going to talk about um, God as being uncircumscribed, not uncircumcised, uncircumscribed. Circumscribed means you can draw a circle around. In the Orthodox liturgy, he's defined as being everywhere present and fills all things. So no matter where, God is there. So, deepest circle of hell, God is there. Lowest part of purgatory, highest part of purgatory, etc. So as we move upwards through these quote-unquote levels of heaven, bear in mind, Dante's going to tell us this is metaphor. They're not really levels of heaven. They are levels of the experience of the grace and glory of God. In other words, all those who are blessed are blessed in, or blessed, in varying levels. But for those who are here, for example, in the first circle, in the sphere of the moon, their experience of God is, is for them as great as those who experience God here. For them, it's totality. Okay? And they are always, Dante will point out, they are always progressing more. They're always experiencing more and more and more of God's glory. It's, it's not like you leave here, and you get to here, and you stop here, and for all eternity, you're... You're parked here on the outskirts of heaven. You're still in, but you're on the outskirts. It's even here on the so-called outskirts, that experience is one of peeling, of peeling the onions off the layer, getting closer and closer and closer to God, just as those all the way here and here are also getting closer and closer and closer. Why? Because of the infinitude of God. It can, he can never be fully known, never be... Um, inexhaustibly known, so to speak. Okay, so where we left off, I've got two things here, should be Canto 2. Oh, before I start, pass all your papers this way. If you've got your paper paper clipped in a folder, take the folder off and staple it. I've got a stapler. <clears throat> Just in case you're curious what everybody else wrote about. Hospitality in the Odyssey. Justice, Vengeance, and the Furies. The Greek idea of family. Crayon, the three-headed monster. Justice as revenge and vengeance within Homer's The Odyssey, Aeschylus's Oresteia, and Sophocles' Antigone, Women of the Oresteia, Avian Imagery in Sophocles' Antigone, The Use of Allegory, Comparisons Between the Parable of the Cave and Inferno, Death, Suffering, and Hamartia in Greek Tragedy and the Divine Comedy. So that's all of those. Okay, Canto 2. Oh, one other thing. 
Um, I will post sometime today, more than likely tomorrow, the essay topics for the final exam. It's going to be essay. It's going to be take home. Right? Um, when I do that, it'll have all the directions. It'll have when it is due. That is date by which it is due, no later. But those of you who want to and have the time, you can turn it in early. Okay, so if you want to get it in next week rather than, it'll probably be the Tuesday of finals week I'll make as the due date. Um, you are welcome to. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. It'll be four or five topics. It'll be short, 750 to 1,000 words. Okay, And to the point. So, Canto 2. Where do I leave off? Dante. Let me back up for a minute. To the end of Canto 1, I think I went over this. Um, talking about providence, yeah, because this will kind of lead us in. He says, line 121, the providence that integrates the whole, that is the whole of the universe, makes limpid with its light that heavenly sphere within which rolls the sphere of greatest speed. It bears us now to our appointed place. That is, providence takes us to where we are supposed to be, that bowstring with its power to aim aright whatever it lets fly to happy targets. That is, what providence intends, providence will fulfill. It will achieve whatever its goal is. It's true, though, just as often, okay, form will fail to be attuned to what the art intends, since matter being deaf will not respond. What is he talking about? What does Dante mean? Form will fail. To what the art intends. Okay. Can anybody give me a concrete example of what he's talking about? Because I'll give you one. And I think it'll surprise you, but maybe not. And it might not be applicable to, be, to anybody in here. But this is what he's talking about. Carlton's looking at me like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> Form will fail to be attuned to what the art intends, since matter, being deaf, will not respond. So too, a creature which can freely bend will, sometimes, though impelled entirely straight, desert that course and wander off elsewhere or somewhere. Every one of you, when you sat down to write your paper, possibly sat down one fell swoop, one sitting, possibly sat down, multiple sittings, revised, etc., etc. Maybe, maybe not. If you were like me, not. <laughs> At least not my first few years in college. I was on a seven-year plan for my undergraduate degree. You sat down, th see, so there is hope for, you know, some of your possibly thinking of going on. You sat down, and probably, hopefully, when you were writing your paper, Hopefully you're thinking this is pretty this is pretty good. I like I kind of like this. Because if you're not thinking that, it's not gonna be good. Okay. <laughs> you gotta have that positive mindset. If you're sitting there thinking, man, this is horrible. This is just utter trash, then probably it's going to be utter trash. Because the art is where? Up here. The art is what you intend. The form, what comes out of that art, is this. I'll bet every one of you, you're going to get your paper back beginning of next semester. Because I won't have them done before then. Well, I'll have them done before then, but I won't have them done before the end of them. Um, they'll, be due, they'll be done by the time grades are due. Let me put it that way. You'll get this back, and there will probably be on every paper at least once. Something like, huh? That's where your art didn't make it through to my mind to where something wasn't clear. But in your mind, it was clear. Well, what happened between your mind and my mind? Our, our minds didn't meet. Okay, So there's a problem there. So where was the breakdown? Is it my stupidity? Possibly. What else could it be? What has to happen between here and here? Okay, 
Up here, what is your idea? And? Perfect. See, Ashley agrees. Up here, she was thinking, you know, if only we could do the Vulcan mind mill. And I'd go, I said, hey, man, what a great idea. But I know some of you are taking a foreign language out. It's kind of like learning a foreign language. What do you have to do in a foreign language class? Usually an awful lot of. You've got to translate. The idea up here is perfect in your mind. That is, in your language. But you've got to get it from your language up here, down here to a language I can read and understand. It's the translation from this to this. That's where the problem probably enters. You think up here you're being exceptionally clear. And I read it and I think, huh? I don't follow. That'll be another one of my famous phrases. I don't follow. I don't understand. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Means I'm clueless. And sometimes I'll write, I'm clueless. Okay? That's what Dante means by that. Okay? Sometimes, he says, form will fail to be attuned to what the art intends. What's the art he's specifically talking about? Providence. God. Okay. We are the form. We don't what? But Sorry, I'm not going to assume about you. I'm going to say about me. I don't understand the mind of God. I might try to get an inkling 99% of the time wrong. Okay, But he's saying our form doesn't respond. Why? Well, because we also have what? It's, one, it's been one of the issues throughout almost everything we've read. Free will. We choose what to do. We can choose whether to allow that stranger at the door to come in. Greek idea of hospitality. We can choose whether to give that beggar something warm when it's cold. Okay? Might be a god, might get screwed by not doing that, but, you know, that's something else. So he says, though impelled entirely straight, impelled, there is that thing that we've talked about several times, that internal genius, daemon, spirit, that impels us forward, that is, it's the thing inside that tells us, according to Dante's theology, we are all meant to be partakers of God. We have free will and we can say, boy, look at that low-hanging fruit over there. That looks pretty good. The apple in the Garden of Eden. He says, we desert that course and... Siri is a moron. That's what Siri is. And wander off elsewhere. Well, what did Beatrice say to Dante just previous to this? You know, you were following me. No, I did not see one sitting there afterwards. If there was, it would probably get put in... Um, the secretary's office in 309. Yep. Um, she tells Dante, I led you. In me you saw God, and then I died. And you didn't what? You didn't follow where I went. Instead, it was like, oh, look. A pretty bird. Oh, look. A sunset. Oh, look. A pretty redhead. Oh, look. And his attention was diverted. Now, she doesn't talk about a bird or sunset. It's the redhead, the brunette, the etc. As lightning flashes fall from thunderclouds, so likewise that first impetus strikes down, wrenched wrong by false delight. That first impetus, that choice. Okay? So, now go to Canto 2. Pick up with 19. Inborn in being, 
Our perpetual thirst to reach the deiform domain now bore us on as rapid almost as the spheres you see. In, born, in, being. It's another one of those phrases. It's kind of like, huh? You know, if I were grading Dante, I'd say, what do you mean, Dante? Well, later on, in a variety of places, he's going to tell us what he means with his imagery. He's going to say, just to make it clear. And he does that for a very specific reason. He wants his meaning to be clear. Because his meaning serves a purpose. He's already said it's salvation. Not for just himself. It's for his readers. Okay? So, inborn in being. What does that mean? Inborn in being. Innate. Innate. To what? Everything physical has something inborn in it, has something innate to it. What does everything, not even every, well, yeah, I guess it would be everything physical. No, it wouldn't be everything physical. Everything made, what does everything made have innate to it, have inborn in it? Sounds like a silly question. See, Siri's trying to answer. <laughs> Wrong marker. Being. It has being in it. Where does being come from? It's God. It's God. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai because he sees a weird light. He goes up there, and there's a bush burning, but not consumed. And he's kind of like, don't see that every day. And a voice speaks out of the bush, says, kick off your shoes. This is holy ground. And Moses goes, okay, don't hear that every day. And God tells him what he wants him to do. And Moses says, yeah, but Pharaoh's going to want to know who you are as will also the Hebrews. How's God answer? Uh, tell them yes. He quotes Popeye. I am. <laughs> I am what I am. That's a long phrase that just means what? I'll use Tennessee English instead of God English. I is. To me, He's the only is. The only self-existing. Everything else exists how? Because God created it. Okay? All being, therefore, everything that exists, exists because of God. Therefore, everything that exists, okay, is kept existing because of God. That's the inborn in being, our perpetual thirst to reach the deiform. Why? Because Dante is adopting this idea that the church held, both the Eastern and the Western church held, that all being, all being, is ultimately what? Drawn towards God. Because he made it. Paul says one of the New Testament books, you know, that in Christ, everything is and has its being. All right? And what Dante is playing on is that everything that has being is trying to get back to the source of being, God. Right? So that some theologians, what are called Universalists, Universalists would suggest that eventually, in the vastness of time, everything will become again reunited with God, including the fallen angels and even Satan. Okay. It will be reunified. That is, it will be as it was intended to be at the beginning. Otherwise, God's will is somehow thwarted. That's their argument. 
Dante doesn't argue that. Dante doesn't believe that for a moment. But what he's saying here in 19 and following is because of this beingness in us, we are drawn towards God. And like water spinning in a drain, what happens as it gets closer to the drain? It spins faster and faster and faster. Okay. God is what create, makes everything move in the universe. The closer you get to God, therefore, the faster and faster and faster and faster and faster you move. So, you leave here, just use, you know, relative terms, pull down a thin air, because it's fast movement, though, you're going light speed. But to go from here to here, you just now double it. And from here to here, you double it again, and here to here, you, or doubled, tripled, quadrupled, quintupled, sextupled. Closer you get to God, the closer you get to God. But when you get to God, God is where? Everywhere. You don't suddenly stop. Why? You become this. Paul, uh, Peter says, I think in the second, epi second epistle of Peter, Know ye not that we are partakers of the divine nature? What's he mean? God. Okay. So, Dante. Inborn in being, our perpetual thirst to reach the deiform domain, now bore us on as rapid. That is, that internal impetus of just being made, just existence, moved us forward. Almost, he says, as fast as the, as the spheres. Because keep in mind, the spheres are rotating. And they're moving fast. Really fast. Okay? Beatrice looked up. Here to here and such. And he says, I looked at her. Why? He's still following. He's been following all the way since here. Down through hell, up through purgatory. He's going to follow Beatrice. And at one point, I think it's Canto 31 or so, Beatrice moves kind of out of his field of vision and he follows somebody else. It's when he gets to somewhere up in here. right? He follows Bernard of Clairvaux, the contemplative, the mystic. And then he even leaves Bernard aside. Why? Because he, he, he has what's going to be called the celestial vision. So, Beatrice looked up, I looked at her. Then maybe in the time an arrow takes to hit the target, fly, and slip the notch, I saw I'd come where something marvelous tugged me in sight towards itself. So she, no thought of mine could be concealed from her, he's talking about Beatrice, turns to me and says, direct, in my, direct your mind in thanks to God, for he has made us one with this first star, okay? first sphere. Dante, if I was there in body, that should ignite in a still more desire to see that being where it can be seen our human nature is at one with God. That's here. Our human nature is at one with God. Okay? Where is it? Well, from the incarnation that is with God. Because what happened? Mary, Holy Spirit. The human nature gets united. There we shall see what here we hold in faith. Not argued through, but known for what it is. That is, we're going to meet a whole bunch of scholastic philosophers. Thomas Aquinas is going to go on and on and on. Before he is Saint Thomas Aquinas. He's made a saint a couple of years after Dante dies. Okay? So here, he's just a doctor, a learned man of the church, later on when we, when we meet him. Dante's saying here, we will get to a point where what? We will no longer understand with our minds, we will understand how. How the angels do, intuitively. It'll be like imprinted on our minds. Not argued through, but known for what it is, as is the primal truth that all believe. All right? 
Yes. This might sound like a silly question, but what are angels? Are angels just ordinary human beings? Within Dante's conception, no. Angels are immaterial spirits. They have no body. They are pure intelligence. Okay? They have no passions. They have no emotions. They are raw intellect. You know, some people would kind of say, take Stephen Hawking out of his body. <laughs> take Einstein out of his body. Take Newton out of his body. Brainiacs. Okay? Pure, raw intelligence. They know intuitively. And everything they know, they know because of their being, no matter where they are in the immediate presence of God. Angel, the very word, angelus, simply means messenger. Okay? But you have ranks of angels. Dante is drawing his ranks of angels, and that's what these are. You have nine ranks of angels, nine circles of hell, ultimately nine levels of heaven and purgatory, etc. Okay? From a guy named Dionysius, He's also called Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite. Okay? The book of Acts tells us about St. Paul converting a guy named Dionysius, okay, who was an Areopagite, lived in Athens. Okay? Another Dionysius, the one called Pseudo-Dionysius, wrote a book um, in, I think it's around the 5th century, it's mentioned in your notes, called On the Celestial Hierarchy, where he talks all about the ranks of angels. Right? Starting with the seraphim and cherubim, thrones, dominations, virtues, powers, principalities, archangels, and angels. He gets this classification from largely Paul in the Old Testament, Ezekiel and Daniel, if I remember correctly. Right? All angelic beings, that is, messengers, but different hierarchy. You can kind of think of them as kings, the seraphim, down to your average run-of-the-mill peasant, angels, the common, ordinary ones. Seraphim are the ones that are continually in the presence of God, praising Him. Angels are the ones that God says, I need you to go do, okay, as are archangels, Gabriel. Michael is called an archangel, and yet he is the chief of the host of heaven. Well, that kind of implies that Michael is equal to the seraphim, but none of the seraphim are actually named. The angels that are named in the Old Testament are all archangels. It's like the others are so far higher that for some reason they're not named as such. Beyond that, I can't really say. Okay? So, um, Dante offers thanks to her, to her, and that's when she explains to him about how he has risen to this first level. Because he's kind of thinking, yeah, but the body's heavy. She's, no, but you're not being governed by physical laws anymore. Okay? So go on to Canto 3, because I, I want to try to get up to about Canto 17 or so today. That way I think we might be able to finish on Tuesday. Canto 3. Um... Skip a little bit at the beginning and pick up with 20, 29. She says, those beings that you see are true, bound here below for vows they disavow. Okay. That's in the chart that's in your book. You get this, this image. Okay, The first sphere, the one that surrounds or is above Earth, is the moon. This contains those blessed souls who failed in their vows on earth. So we're going to meet a couple of nuns. Okay. They were nuns who were 
forcibly taken from their convent and given into marriage and had children. And they're kind of going, kind of going to be said, not kind of, it is going to be said, I think by Mary, uh, excuse me, by Beatrice. They gave up their vows. They could have remained faithful to their vows. What would have been required of them? No. Death. If they'd really wanted to remain faithful, they would have died. Rather than going through with the marriages. Right? In which case, if they had died, they wouldn't be here. But she's not saying, Beatrice isn't saying, they are lesser beings, lesser citizens of heaven. No, they couldn't kill themselves, but if they failed, if they didn't acquiesce to the marriage, they would be killed. They would be killed, exactly. Okay. So then, this is the level of the sphere of the moon. Those who are in this sphere are those who fail to vows on earth. And it's not just nuns. I'm not you know, picking on women or anything. It's all those who fail their vows on earth. Where that's their major fault. So maybe the vow is the vow of fidelity in marriage. Maybe it's some other promise that was made. That was a major promise. Okay? This circle represents the angels. The lowest of the nine. Okay? You go up from there. And notice when Dante passes through here. He literally passes through the moon. And they have a long discussion about... Why there are dark and light spots of the moon? We're not going to talk about that at all. Okay? Then they go through the sphere of Mercury. Those who are here, those human souls that are here, are those who loved glory on earth. All right? That's where the archangels are. They go up from there to Venus. Those are those who were passionate. Not passionate, angry, passionate in love. Those whose lives were marked by Eros. Not Caritas, not Agape, okay? That's where the principalities are. They go from there to the sun. Those are the wise. Why? Because the sun is an image of illumination and wisdom. Who does he meet there, for example? Wisest man on earth. Not, so not Socrates. Solomon. And Solomon talks for a long time. Then they go to the courageous, etc. So we're going to work our way through these. So, um, she goes on, 32. The light of truth that feeds them with its peace will never let their feet be turned awry. That is, will never let them be turned so that they are not facing God. So, pick up with 43. We, living in God's love, can no more lock our doors against true-minded aims of will than God's love does, which wills this court like him. That is, this court, meaning this sphere, is kind of like God. Uncircumscribed. It has no center. God is everywhere. That is, wherever God is, is the center. But God is everywhere. So, God is everywhere, then this is the center. And this is the center. This is the center. This is why... Dante arrives at such a point, Canto 33, and what happens? The brain kind of shuts off. Okay. In fact, long before then, he gets to the point where he kind of paraphrases St. Paul. When St. Paul says, I knew a man once who was caught up into the seventh heaven. Okay. And he says, can't tell you anything that happened because he didn't didn't have any words to describe what he saw. Dante's going to be the same way. Right? So, this speaker goes on and says, line 46, I was a virgin sister in the world, down below, I was a nun. Search deep in memory, my being now more beautiful won't hide me from your eyes. In other words, she's saying, come on Dante, look at me. Well, his eyes are still adjusting. And he does see her for who she is. I am Picarda. She is the sister 
of one of his friends. The friend that he saw in, I can't remember, is it in Purgatory or, or in the Inferno? Because the friend asks, do you know what's happened to Picarda? And Dante doesn't know, right? Now he does. She had been a virgin nun, but she says, she goes on, the flames of what we feel are lit in us by pleasure purely in the Holy Spirit, dancing for happiness in that design. And though the part allotted us may seem far down, that is, and though in heaven we are far down, the lowest, she says, the reason is that, yes, we did neglect our vows. These were in some part void. That is, our vows were made void. Dante's like, you don't look lower down to me, okay? So tell me, he says, have you no wish to gain some higher grade? Come on, Picarda, where's your ambition? Why don't you want to be higher? Come on, just try, and maybe God will let you climb the ladder of success, and you could reach the love of glory. Tell me, you who are so happy here, have you no wish to gain some higher grade, to see and be as friends to God still more? Don't you want to get closer to God? She smiles. Why? Because she's looking at Dante and she says, oh, you're so naive. You don't understand. Dear brother, we in will are brought to rest by power of caritas that makes us will no more than what we have nor thirst for more. In other words, we are at perfect peace and rest here. Why? Because my will now is in total sync with God's will. For her, I am in the presence of God. That's it. Were our desire to be more highly placed, all our desires would what? Then be out of tune with his. She would introduce discord into the divine harmony. Tolkien in his creation, in the whole Middle Earth creation, he has it begun, he has everything created by song. Okay? And the way everything is marred is somebody with a voice like mine chimes in. And it's no longer harmony. It's okay? so, quick question. Yeah. So, so when he's meeting all these people in paradise who are Calling their memories. Right. Do they not, do you not lose? Because when you cross over. You cross over the lefty yeah. and you forget all your sins. But you still retain the memory of, of the sin or just the fact that it, it is sin? I don't know. I don't know how he explains that. Because he crosses over lefty and says something and Beatrice smiles at him. And then she says it's because you no longer remember. Maybe when he leaves, this is a big maybe. Maybe when he leaves the earthly paradise and comes up here, maybe that memory is granted back. Why? Because it can no longer be harmful. Because up here, you're now blessed. You're now in whatever level you're in. You're in the presence of God. You're not in the presence of God in the earthly paradise. After the fall, you're not. Okay? That's my best guess answer. So she says... Yes, <clears throat> discord in these spheres cannot occur. As you, if you reflect on this, will see. Why? Because charity, not giving stuff, love. Love. Love of others. Love for the other's well-being. Charity is a priori here. That is, charity is a given. It is what Thomas Jefferson would call an inalienable right. It, it's the starting point. Okay? In formal terms, our being in beatitude, blessed, entails in holding to the will of God. There's that inherence idea again. That the will of God now completely inheres with them. Our own wills thus made one with God the divine. See, that's not, by the way, 
That's not what the case was when God made Adam and Eve in the garden. Because what did he say? You can have anything you want in here. Everything's yours. But the two trees that stand at the center of the garden, stay away from those. One's the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. What's the other one? Tree of immortality. Okay? You can eat everything else, but not these two. So why does God give that divine prohibition? Okay. Created free will, supposed to have a choice. Does that mean he has to create the two trees? Could he not create free will and just say, have at it? Okay. According to the early church fathers and on, it's so that humanity could develop and grow to be like God. Let me get rid of this. See, the way the early church fathers took those two verses of Genesis is that humanity is made in the image of God and is made in the likeness of God. They're not synonyms. Most traditional Western Christians, Protestant or Catholic, take those to be synonyms. But this is the image of God meaning what? Free will. Can choose. Likeness means, means this is what they are supposed to grow into. Well, how do you grow into the likeness of God? There's a word up here. By growing in virtue. How do you grow in virtue? Do you, be, do, do you become more virtuous by passing laws? No. Think, you know, use this as an example. What has this become for, let's say, oh, let's not cast aspersions, let's say some. Teenage, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old men. What does this become a source of? What's the use of this for? Is it to study Dante's Divine Comedy? No. I mean, Lavandri is giving me looks and Carlton. It's for pornography. I think it's more the literal answer. Yeah, I want the literal answer. <laughs> it's sex, man. Okay. So, to, would removing pornography make men who are susceptible to pornography more virtuous? No, it wouldn't. What makes them more virtuous? Bingo. Which takes what? Two word phrase. Starts with W. <laughs> Ends with er, will power. <laughs> okay. Or the power of the will, the ability to choose. Okay. So you can pass all the laws in the world. That doesn't make people more moral. It doesn't make them more righteous. It, it just means you're passing all kinds of laws. The only thing that makes someone more moral is an act of the will, a choice. That's why C.S. Lewis, and I can't remember which work he, he writes this in, he says, you know, and, and he's not the first one. John Donne says this in one of his, um, what is it he says this is? Meditation 17. He says, you know, you want to stop a bad habit? Smoking. What's the hardest thing to stop smoking or drinking or any habit? The first time. You want that cigarette. Or eating. You want that piece of candy. You eat that piece of candy. And there's another one and another one and another one and another one. Okay? It's the first time stopping one. That makes the next time a little tiny bit easier. That makes the next time a little tiny bit easier. In other words, Shakespeare says... If you don't have the habit, act as though, you, I mean, some of you, you've read Hamlet, right? Did you read Hamlet? You didn't read Hamlet. 
Oh, are you in the... Okay. Um, well, in my Shakespeare course in the spring, we'll read Hamlet, and we'll see the play. Hamlet tells his mother, Gertrude, who's sleeping with his uncle, because they got married after his father was killed by his uncle. He says, even though you don't have virtue, pretend you do. In other words, don't go to your inseamed bed tonight. And it'll make tomorrow night easier not to go to that inseamed bed. And it'll make the next night even. And Hamlet says, by pretending to be virtuous, what will happen? She will develop virtue. Okay? So, by choosing what? Can't eat that one. I choose not to. What happens? You develop into the likeness of God. According to the early church fathers, if Adam and Eve had never eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, yes, one, they would not have known evil. They would never have understood what evil is. But what else would have happened? They would have kind of rocket shot. <laughs> To godlikeness. It's not like C.S. Lewis in another one of his novels, Paralandra, redoes the Garden of Eden. He rewrites the temptation scene. And he has a character there in a wonder. Because he realizes this is the Garden of Eden all over. Is this what it was really like? Did Satan, because the, the book of Genesis kind of implies what? You know, Adam and Eve, they're kicking back, they're laying around, whatever. And then one day, the snake crawls up to Eve and says, Hey, have you taken a look? And she goes, Really? I mean, first temptation, she's gone for it. Okay. Lewis kind of suggests, maybe that's not what one happened or what would have happened. Maybe it would have been a continual. The first day the snake comes, she says no. The second day the snake comes, the third day. The 358 millionth day the snake comes. Until, in Paralander's case, somebody comes and does something about the snake. <laughs> Lewis implies that after maybe more than one temptation, but fewer than, let's say, a hundred, God would have said, you've done enough. <laughs> you proved what? The virtue. Because what happens, okay, maybe not to everybody, but to almost everybody, eventually, if the temptation happens again and again and again and again, like water on granite, it wears it down. Okay? So, she goes on and says, line 85, in his volition is the peace we have. In his will is the peace we have. That is the sea to which all being, all existence, rocks, trees, bugs, flies, cockroaches, maggots, people, everything, moves. Be it what that creates or nature blends. Dante. Now I get it. I saw that everywhere in paradise there's heaven. Though grace may reign in varied measure from the highest good. Remember Socrates. The highest good. That's what it should be sought in this life. Okay? And I think that's why some church fathers, as, I, as I've said, really disagreed with Dante long before Dante wrote. And they put Socrates in heaven. Why? Because he sought the highest good, which they understood to be God. Okay? So, Dante just said what? For those who are here, that's the center. And for those who are here, that's the center. Why? Title of Zora Neale Hurston's book, yeah, their eyes were watching God. They're focused right there. Okay. So, he then meets somebody else. 
St. Clair of Assisi, and she talks and says some stuff, which I'm going to skip because we're only on Canto 4 and we've only got 20 minutes left. So, goes on to Canto 4. Um, let's see. Beatrice addresses Dante, and she's going to do this multiple times, kind of each time they rise, and, and in between them. She's going to say, something's bothering you. And because I see clearly, why? Because she sees with the light of God, St. Paul says, Corinthians, talking about the resurrection, now that it's here down on earth, we see but through a glass darkly. Make of lenses covered with a film of grime. In other words, we don't see very well down here, but then, after the resurrection, he says, we shall see without glasses. We shall see face to face. We will know as we are known. In other words, we'll be like Harry Potter and King's Cross in the final book. No glasses. No scar. Perfect. Right? So Dante asks, because Beatrice can see this, she says, your thinking runs. If will to good endures, how then can violence wrought by other hands reduce in the measure of desert? In other words, if these people down here are here because of their broken vows, how can their desire to have done good be impeded by the rotten actions of somebody else. Right? A nun who is forced into marriage and forced into childbirth. She wanted to say a nun, right? She didn't. Well, she goes on. Line 28. The most engodded of the seraphim, that is, the seraphim that is closest to, him, to God, that has the most God-likeness about it. Moses and Samuel, and either John, you care to mention, even Maria, that is, even Mary herself. None is enthroned in any other sphere than those souls are who've just appeared to you. Nor are their years existing more or less. What? what? She's going to explain. The spheres, they're images. All add in beauty to the highest gyre. Some sense the eternal breathing more, some less. Those who experience it less, guess what? Down in the lower spheres. Those who experience it more, those who see, experience God more clearly, they're closer to God. Even though we're not talking about geographical, spatial location. She says, They did here show themselves, but not because this sphere has been a lot of them as theirs. They signify celestial power least raised. Signified. That means what you've seen, Dante, they're just symbols. It's not the reality. To speak in this way fits the human mind. Right? When, when we speak of God, how do, you, how do people speak of him? They speak of the right hand of God. That Jesus ascended and sat at the right. Does God literally have a right hand? Well, humanity is made in the image of God. So what about the child who's born without arms? Is that child not born in the image of God doesn't have anything to do with hands and arms. Jesus says, you know, he describes God as a mother hen. So does that make God into a chicken? Why does he use the image? Because one of the scholastics, Anselm, Abelard, can't remember which, says God is that beyond which we can think. Well, okay. So if he's beyond that which we can think, then we can't what? We can't think of him. It, if you want. But if we can't think of it, then how do we even talk? Of, well, what do we do? We anthropomorphize. We give 
face. May God make his face to shine upon you. The Old Testament prayer reads, does God literally have a face? Well, after December 25th, yes. After the incarnation, God had a face, which is why it can be portrayed in imagery. Prior to then, when, when Moses quote-unquote saw God on Sinai, what did he see? Light, yeah, light. Okay? Not a face. So when God said, well, I'm going to hide you behind the cliff to the rock so you can see my backside. Does that mean God's wearing like one of those hospital gowns that's open in the back and he's flashing Moses? No. What's he mean? You're going to see my glory. So when Moses comes down, what does he have to put on his face? A veil. Why? Because it's not like there's somebody there with a 5,000 candle Watt flashlight, you know, wherever he goes, shining it on his face. It's because Moses has light shining through his skin because he's been in the presence of God. What are you looking at, Mom? You're... Oh, okay. I'm thinking she's closer to God, so she sees more than I do. <laughs> so she says, I'm using this language. Why? Because this is what you can comprehend. Who's the you? Dante and us. Because Dante can't write this big old long book and say, guess what, I went to heaven. Saw a lot. Hope you get the point. That doesn't quite get the point across. For you can only grasp through things what you've sensed. All right? Every one of us has sensed fathers, mothers, children, Right hand, left hand, okay, breathing, sighing, sorrowing. For this same reason, Scripture condescends to your capacities. It says that God has hands and feet. So, Holy Church will also represent Michael and Gabriel. Angels with what? Human faces. Do the angels have faces? No. Do the angels have wings? No, do they look like fat little cherubs who have eaten too much? No. The wings are merely indica indicative of what? They've got the FedEx, you know, they're messengers. That's it. The heavenly UPS, you know, drivers. 76. She says, she goes on to talk about what Dante asks about free will. You know, but... Picarda intended to be a nun for the rest of her life. So how come she gets, you know, penalized to be down here because some guy essentially, let's, I mean, let's just use ball thing. Some guy essentially raped her. Okay, it's rape under marriage. But she was forced into this marriage. She was forced to have children. Free will, unless it wills, cannot be quenched. That's pretty strong language. What is she saying? She, Picarda, let's say, gave up. She could have what? As I said earlier, she could have died. Ah, not going to give in to you. You've got to kill me. Well, people have done that all throughout history. They've said, nope, I'm not going to do what you asked me. You have to kill me instead. All right? But if it bends free will... Whatever the degree, it follows force. And we could go all off if we wanted to. We could say, well, oh, what are the relevance of these texts to life today? Uh, Matt Lauer. <coughs> I mean, from what we've read, from what we've heard, from the women who say these things happen to them, you know, and NBC is lying through their teeth when they say, oh, we don't know anything about this. Oh, Really? You didn't install the button on the underside of his desk that locked the door so that when a woman came in his room, she couldn't leave until he unlocked the door. Not just a door like this. I mean, it's, we're, and, and apparently his wasn't the only door that was like that. Okay, so let's just, 
you know, burn down the whole edifice of modern media. Because she says, if it bends whatever the degree, it follows force. These women, though they could have fled to holy ground, did bend like this. Now, she might mean they could have fled to a church, you know, sanctuary. We have sanctuary cities today. She means real sanctuary. If these guys really were adamant about burying them, what would they have to do? Violate not just the women. Bad. Violate holy ground. Violate mother church. In other words, piss off Mary. Piss off Jesus. Do you really want to go there? Had they, in what they willed, stood absolute, as did St. Lawrence on the burning coal. So what does she do? She brings up a murder. And there's tons of murders. Okay? Martyrs are what? People who said, no, I'm not going to bow down before that idol. You have to kill me. No, I'm not going to give you X, Y, Z. You have to kill me. Okay? She says, their wills would then have thrust them once released back on the road from which they'd just been drawn. But will as firm as that is very rare. Notice. And it's for that that they're kind of excused. Not everybody has that kind of will. I mean, the one upon whom Christ built his church, Peter. What does Peter do before the crucifixion? Three times. Don't know him. Never heard of Jesus. Wouldn't recognize him if I saw him. Okay. And then Jesus comes back from the dead, and three times he asks Peter a question. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He's shouting, Lord, you know I do. Lord, you know I do. And Jesus is like, yeah, but four days ago, <laughs> you said something completely up. Just making sure here, Pete. You know. Okay. Canto 5 in the ten minutes we have left. Good Lord. <laughs> so, um, Beatrice says I'm going to skip, up, skip something I thought at the beginning line 19 the greatest gift that God in spacious deed made all created in spacious deed that is in the act of creating God gave out all kinds of gifts the, but the greatest gift and most nearly formed to his liberality most prized by him was what liberty in actions of the will free will, with which all creatures of intelligence, and they alone, both were and are endowed. All creatures of intelligence. And that's us. Angelic beings. They can choose. Lions, tigers, bears. What's a tiger do when it sees a rabbit? Yeah, why? Because a tiger does what a tiger does. That's, does it sit there and go, oh, shoot, I'm hungry, but that rabbit probably has little bunnies at home. If I kill it, it'll be mine. No, it doesn't even think about that. It says, food, okay? Now they'll appear, if you pursue this thought, the value and nobility of vows. When framed so God's consent consents with yours. For in a pact confirmed by God and man, the treasure gift I speak of is itself made sacrifice. That is, the vow becomes a sacrifice. So what restitution can there be if you break the vow? How can you make up for it? You think you'll make good use of what you gave? Well, that's to try good works with stolen cash. That is, you think you can break your vow and then say, but I'll make it up to you, God. Well, look at the analogy. That's like doing good works with stolen cash. That's like giving to the poor. My giving to the poor, but my going through Ashley's purse, taking all the money and credit cards out of there, going down to Walmart and buying a whole bunch of stuff. She says, do you really think God would look at that and say, oh, what a kind, generous person he is. No, that's kind of the, the you know, oh, I shouldn't go there. It's kind of the definition of socialism. Taking from somebody else to give to somebody else. Not taking from myself 
to give to somebody else. So, essential in a sacrifice, line 43, are two considerations. What we'll do, then formally, the fact that we agree, that is, we consent to do this. So, 73, be weightier, who? Christians, in moving vows. Don't flutter on every breeze like feathers. Don't suppose every vow will... In other words, don't take vows lightly. Only say what you mean and mean what you say. Okay? You've got the Old Testament and the New Testament and a shepherd in the church. That is, the church is the shepherd, not talking about a pastor within the church, to be your guide. That's enough for your salvation. This is Dante speaking to whom? Early 14th century Florentines and other Italians and other readers. Okay. So finally, they go from here, here, to here. They go from the moon to Mercury. Okay. I'm going to skip that. Uh, He meets Justinian, the Emperor Justinian, Canto 6, which I'm going to skip a lot. And Justinian says, you know, before I codified the whole Roman law, I thought of Christ as single and divine, not truly man, contented in that faith. In other words, he believed a heresy. But he's later convinced that he is divine. The heresy that he's talking about is the Arian heresy, which comes from yeah, a priest named Arius. Arius taught early 4th century BC, excuse me, early 4th century AD. Arius taught Christ wasn't fully God. He, in fact, he said Christ wasn't God. There was a point in time, Arius famously wrote, when Christ was not. There's a point of time, point in time, when the Son of God did not exist. Okay. This kind of riled people up. Had a lot of followers. This is in Egypt. He had a lot of followers. And it got to the point where there was huge dissension in the church. So the emperor, Constantine, 325 AD, called a council. It's the first order called the seven ecumenical councils. Ecumenical means of the entire church. Bishops came from all the churches... To these councils. This first council, 318 bishops came to. Okay? The council was essentially to assert one thing. It wasn't to have a meeting, take a vote, and decide who wins. It was to assert from the outset, Arius is wrong. Okay? It was to assert the divinity of Christ. And it's from this council that the first part of what's called the Apostles' Creed comes from. Or excuse me, the Nicene Creed comes from. That part that says that Christ is very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Trinity, or one essence with the Father, etc. In other words, same thing. And they come up with a word. They create a word to describe him. Homo usias, of the same essence. But if you put one letter in there, it changes it. Homo eusias means like the same essence. Like God. This one means God. Very God, etc. Okay? Um... Where was I going at? Oh, because Justinian. Well, Justinian believed Arius at first and then changed his thinking and adopted the more traditional standard orthodox perspective. Okay? By the way, one of those bishops, according to the acts of this council, one of those bishops who was there was a guy named Nicholas from the town of Myra in the country of Lycia, Santa Claus. 
It's the same Nicholas that is the origin of Santa Claus. Okay? And according to the early tradition of the church, this dates from like the late 4th, early 5th century. Nicholas stood up after Arius said what he said and decked him. Didn't even argue, just knocked him out. And for that was thrown in prison. And the emperor had a vision. And in the vision, Christ came to him and said, let Nicholas out. He was defending me. And Nicholas comes out. So, Canto 7. Uh, I know, we've only got two minutes. Now, we'll stop there. So, we'll start with Canto 7, and I'm going to skip a couple of cantos just, you know, entirely. 